I guess, 11 days or on the 28th of July, Venezuela will have its highly anticipated presidential elections. So for the past 25 years, almost, Venezuela government has been under the, the uh, under Chavismo or um, Chavez regime, which word we want to choose doesn't matter too much. And this is the first Venezuelan election that more, in more than a decade, which the opposition candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, backed by the oppositional leader and highly popular person today in Venezuela, Marina Corina Machado, has a reasonable chance of winning. So Venezuela is a prime case of a petrol state. That's one of the reasons why we are discussing on the scope of extractivism project. It's one of the first oil countries in the world with, with uh, uh, <coughs> so sorry, with the largest proven oil reserves in the world. It's heavily dependent on the exports of this oil, accounting for a huge part of the GDP and the government revenues. Since 2013, the country has been living in a double yet complementary crisis politically since the death of Chavez and the rise of Maduro in power, uh, which has a struggle to maintain his legitimacy in growing more contested and closed re and authoritarian regime. Economically, the drop of the oil prices and low products levels of, of the national oil product, uh, production has immersed the country in deep crisis, inflation, unemployment, debt, and immigration. So discussing how we arrive here and what are the perspectives from Venezuela are not, uh, not only after the election, but in a broader context of global transformations becomes very important for the extractivism project. So the extractivism research project explores the political and economic insertions of the global South countries that have specialized in extraction and exportation of raw materials, particularly in Latin America and the Maghreb. We want to understand the sources of change and persistence of, of what we are calling the extractivist development model and how this has played out with how, how this is playing out with current energy transitions. So we invited you guys for uh, specialists in Venezuela to discuss this context of the upcoming elections. We'll debate who are the possible winners and losers in terms of political, ecological, societal, societal economical terms. So we also explore the quest for free elections, possibilities of democratic transition, contested goals for the future. The, the topics are broad and what we invited each of our guests to have some uh, initial thoughts uh, related to their own current research and work. So first we, we have Anais Lopez, which is a socialist socialist sociologist from the University Central of Venezuela. She's an expert in gender studies and development planning from the Centro de Estudios de Desarrollo, El Sendes. At the same university since 2018, she has been the project area coordinator for at the Friedrich Ebert Ischte Foundation in Venezuela, Caracas. Second, we have Manuel Sutherland, is an economist from Sendes Auch, also at the University Central of Venezuela. He has worked at the Industrial Bank of Venezuela in the Ministry of Planning and Development, and is the founder and director of the Centro de Investigación y Formación Obrera since 2015. He has written about economic crisis, oil rentierism, social, socialist revolution, and the collapse of extractivism in Venezuela. Third, we have Osmer Manzano, is a professor at Walsh School of Foreign Service in Georgetown University, a lecturer at the George Washington University, and a regional economic advisor the, as the, for the country department in the Indian countries in the Inter-American Developmental Bank. He works on developmental challenges and an emphasis on natural resources, energy, and growth. And both Manuel and Osmel have been fellows at the Extractivism Project here in the University of Kassel. And finally, we have Benedict Bull as a professor of political science at the Center of Development and Environmental at the University of Oslo. She was the director of the Norwegian Network for Latin American Research between 2008 to 2020. And it's the president of the board of the Nordic Institution, Institute for Latin American Studies at the University of Stockholm. Her research focuses on the role of elite institutions and external forces in sustainable development in Latin America. She has written extensively on political changes in Venezuela. As for me, I'm Lisa Serioli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Kassel, and I work at Extractivism Project. Currently, I am uh, working on the possibility of transnational cross-comparison extractivism country, particularly oil countries such as Venezuela, Algeria, Saudi Arabia. Um, with that being said, I think we can start with the discussion. I will give the floor uh, exactly in the order. So we will start with Anais and her points on the current uh, election. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Luisa, and to the rest of, of the panel uh, for the invitation to speak about and from Venezuela at a transcendental moment for my country. While it is true, I'm going to read because my English is not well trained. So <laughs> 
the time that I have to, if I have to stop, you let me know and I can continue in the discussion. While it is true that there have already been other important electoral moments, such as uh, 2013 presidential election in which Maduro came to power with a close margin of vote against the unitary candidate Enrique Capriles Radowski, as well as the election of the National Assembly in 2015, in which Chavismo lost the qualified majority, majority of the National Assembly, ignoring this victory, using the rest of the public powers under its control. The subsequent electoral events were marked by an opposition policy that remained between the insurrection and the boycott of the electoral process that followed, including the 2018 presidential election. After 25 years in power, as you, as you said, this is the electoral event in which there is a real threat that the Chavista regime will be faced in a presidential election with the possibility of a defeat that will force it to leave power. In view of the will manifest of change collected by the main surveys and opinion stories as well, as the testimonies that have accompanied the massive demonstrations of support for the formula embodied by the candidate of the unitary platform, Edmundo González Urrutia, and the political leader, Maria Corina Machado, the led candidate in, prim in primaries, but politically disqualified from participating. How are the elections uh, being organized? The absolute control that the Chavista regime maintains over public powers, including electoral power, has allowed it for several years to manipulate, manipulate the calendar and the law and the law of electoral process um, in its favor. In democratic Venezuela, and this includes, includes part of Chavez Venezuela, presidential elections used to be held in the last quarter of the year. On March 5, 2024, it was announced that the presidential election will be on July 28, playing, playing on the margin of the agreement signing Barbados with opposition actors on electoral rights and, guarantee, and guarantees that established that the elections should be held in the second half of 2024. This, this agreement was signed in October of 2023 such a short margin of time, challenge the limit of what can be understood as a fair election for the opposition factors. Given the little time for the organization and construction of agreements around the unitary candidate, the electoral, the electoral register in Venezuela and abroad, only 70,000 now new voters were allowed to register out of just over 4.5 million potential voters who, who could have voted abroad. And the resources to campaign in a context in a context of financial restrictions and political violence promoted for the state towards the opposition factors representing the unitary platform, but especially those around Maria Corina Machado. As I am talking to you last night was detained the, her security boss and nobody know, knows where he is and he's disappeared. And these are news uh, with, with Venezuelans are awaking every day uh, in the last two months since the campaign began. With, Elaine, with 11 days left until the election, there is a threat that through the judiciary, the candidate Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia will be disqualified and the cards of the parties that support his candidacy, especially the card uh, of the La Mesa de la Unidad, that has been the most publicized in the campaign promoted by Machado. There are also the cards of the Social Democratic Party, Un Nuevo Tiempo, y, and the Movimiento Progresista de Venezuela of Progressive Orientation, and whose leaders come on from or were part of Chavismo during its first decade in power. In Venezuela, about popular movement and organizations. In Venezuela, popular organizations were for a long time an important base of the Chavista movement. Neighborhood organizations, peasant organizations, women's organizations, and unions accompanied much of the first Chavista decade in power. While the opposition traditionally 
traditionally called uh, on the middle and professional sectors. This does not mean that there were no sectors of the popular mover, movement that were not opposition, only that Chavismo captured a good part of these organizations and their demands for a long time. With the death of Chavez, the advent of the economic crisis, essentially the result of poor state management, bad public policies, massive corru corruption, and a severe pol policy of repression of protests, erode the Chavista bases in the popular movement. In a reversal of proportions, today the sectors of the popular movement that defend the continuity of the Maduro government are a minority. This sector is divided into those who defend clientelistic policies and those who for ide ideological reasons would never vote for an opposition candidate. Two examples of these sectors are those groups in Trotsky's organizations such as the Socialism and Freedom Party and the League of Socialist Workers that today they call openly to vote null. And sectors there's sectors made, made of Chavista middle ca ca cadres, it, those who abandoned or were expelled from the Maduro government, government, grouped in the other campaign who called to vote against the neoliberal consensus that in their analysis exists between the Maduro government and the opposition factors that participate in the electoral contest. Elsewhere is the platform platform in, the in defense of the constitution, which brings together former ministers of the president Chavez and former leaders of the democratic left who demanding their independence, consider calling to vote for the candidate of the unitary platform. And in case of that, this be disabled by the option defined by the unitary, unitary platform in case it does not choose, it does, it does not choose to call for abstention about society's expectations, and now I'm about to finish already. For July 28, we Venezuelans are preparing for a long and historical day. The expectation of change have exceeded the government's own, own capabilities to contain it with repression and have provided a campaign of unitary platform led, led by Machado with an epic that feels of encouragement to the population. The blocking of roads by security force of government officials, the closure of establishment that, establishments that serve food, food to Maria Corina Machado or house her, the arbitrary detention of the people in charge of tra transportation, log logistics, sound, and organization, so far do not seem to reserve to reverse the desire of the majority willing to vote, and that this vote is for the government to change. Politically, Chavismo has absolute control of the, of the entire state apparatus, including fear and repression, before, during, and after the election. There is a lot of uncertainty about the role that the middle commanders of the armed force can, can play and whether or not they will comply with the constitution in the event that Chavismo, with all the control it has over the election, fails to contain the massive vote of the population or subsequent protests protest in case Maduro proclaims his re-election. Although the entire narr narrative of Maduro's campaign indicates that he's not willing to recognize defeat and therefore hand over power to the opposition. Only on July 28, we will know what the government is willing to do and how far it can really go the opposition led by my, Maria Corina Machado to assert the majority that the, poll, that the polls give to her, to the candidate of the platform. In the event that this does not happen, the question is whether the will to persist on the electoral road in advance in the consolidation of the democratic of organization of the opposition will be maintained beyond this electoral event and more based on programmatic agreements for the democratization of Venezuela in the medium and long term. In a context of high geopol geopolitical instability and structural change in the extractive dynamics in the region, 
in which both Maduro and the opposition project themselves as suppliers of raw materials, fundamentally oil, gas, and associated minerals to the energy transition. That's, that would be all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Anais. Great remarks. I think we can move forward to Manuel. Um, first remarks. You have to turn your mic on, Manuel. Uh, no. Yes. Right. Well, um, thanks for the invitation to everybody. Uh, Anais Osmel, uh, my tutor, Benedict Bull, and Luisa, my friend. Uh, Hannes Hans, uh, the Strexmist group. It's a, uh, it's a very quiet, uh, intelligent, um, brilliant, uh, cool of guys. Uh, well, I'm going to try to speak uh, fast and quickly. I have uh, a lot of information to share. I'm going to watch my chronograph to try to to try to be disciplined with the time. And um, fine. The for me, uh, the ruin of hyper rentures and the enormous possibility of a drastic political change. This is my presentation for today. Well, first of all, uh, I want to talk about the structural economic crisis. Um, for me, um, it's very important to say that uh, probably we have fallen 70% uh, or 80% of the GDP uh, for 2013 to 2017, not 2021. Venezuela could have the third worst economic crisis in worldwide in history. And um, I think that uh, if we grow by 5% uh, for 30 years, we can reach the GDP of 2013. It's very, it's very deep, the, the hole. Well, uh, the second uh, rentierism myth of development and persistency of the extractivism practice in Venezuela. Um, for me, rentier capitalism is an unfeasible structure for development. Rentierism lacks self-regulation mechanisms and tends to political excess. Rentings and presidentialism tend to favor authoritarianism and inefficiency. Venezuela will be a loser in the energy transition. We cannot to prepare to that. And uh, I think when the crisis break out, the rentier state lose enormous political power and um, offer, often resort to repression to compensate for the fault in the income. Well, problems in the democracy of Venezuela. Um, uh, entry in the election, the presidential elections, I think that the popularity of PSUV, the Socialist Party Unite of Venezuela, could be 20% or at the top 30%. This is the historical floor of his hard block. The continuity of the crisis make the government more aggressive. Um, we have a very aggressive government. We have a, a, an increase from the repression. I think that the economic disaster is so severe um, that the new Chavez bourgeoisie would benefit from a political change that would uh, organize the country and rebuild it and rebuild it. They had a lot of investment and capital submerged 
in our country. I think that the a big group of the Chavis entrepreneur um, think that the a political change is good for their interest. Never before has the opposition faced such an unpopular and weakness and weakness Chavist government so much so that there was not even a very populist expansion of the public spending to attract vote. Well, closing my presentation, I have three scenarios for July 29th, the day after. Well, in the first scenario, the government and USA reach political agreement and the opposition can triumph and begin a democratic transition with all political powers against uh, Edmundo. Um, there is a economic opening, return of investment, and a and, and very big increase of political liberties. The economy could grow with the lifting sanctions, uh, probably the first year 10%. In the second scenario, the government and the USA have no rich basil, basic political agreement to recognize an opposition victory, which is would be resisted by the Chavism. There is a limit economic um, opening and uh, much uncertainty about the Hanover of power in January. The economy could grow with a very limited lifting of sanctions. In the third scenario, in a very fraudulent election, the government wins an unbelievable victory after Edmundo disqualified. There is a low economic opening, more limits or, um, on political freedoms, and would be more repression. Sanctions would be maintained, even Chevron license would be eliminated and capital would live. In this scenario, I think the economy could fall by up uh, to probably 10% due to enormous energy difficulties and very weak solvent demand. Uh, we have a uh, probably almost three years without um, wages growth. A renewed exodus will be followed, I, I, I think. Well, uh, this is all. Thanks for everybody. Uh, seven minutes and 38 seconds. Perfect use of your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll pass now to a smell. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, uh, Luisa. It's great to be in this panel with uh, uh, Anais, Manuel, and Benedict. And uh, well, and it's great to be back at Casel <laughs> only a month later, uh, but uh, happy to be here. So I, I'm going to discuss a little bit, you know, about uh, the oil sector. No, um, This election comes after an unprecedented collapse in the oil sector, no? In, in 2008, production was almost 3 million barrels a day. Uh, it collapsed to around 500,000 barrels a day uh, in 2020. And today is around 800,000, a little bit more uh, barrels a day. You know? um, uh, and of course, uh, because of that collapse, we have the economic collapse that Manuel just mentioned. You know? the, the GDP to today is around 25, 20% of the GDP that it was in 2008. Um, um, there is a, a, a lot of debate whether this is due to the sanctions or the lack of the capacity to manage the, the sector. Uh, however, recent peer review literature, there is a recent paper, uh, an interesting recent paper that tries to separate these things. And at the end, suggests that both have played a role. Uh, 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 so, so, so clearly, uh, the issue about the managing of the sector uh, is key 
to understand the collapse of the oil sector. No? Uh, um, then the question is what comes next? Uh, and there are huge expectations. No? Historically, uh, uh, as many people that know Venezuela, uh, uh, oil has been a key element in the transformation of the country. No? If you look at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, only Haiti was poorer than Venezuela. No? Uh, so Venezuela was a really poor country. Uh, uh, and then go forward 40 to 50 years later, uh, and then only Argentina was richer than Venezuela, no, in the uh, like 1960s or something like that. No, this huge transformation of the country has been on the back of oil. No, so so we have the the discoveries, the famous uh, 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 Mene, the Barroso dos, all the oil discoveries that, that we know, uh, and then you have this huge increase in oil production, and Venezuela became an oil producer. No, so you cannot separate the transformation of the country with the discovery of oil, no? Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, uh, we have been doing a work a little bit on how people see the extractive sector based on narrative. And in Latin America, including Venezuela, of course, but it's interesting that in Latin America, oil is usually associated with transformation. I think that's a, a very interesting thing to have in your mind because it's different how people see mining, no? So, so usually uh, people have a relatively uh, more positive view of oil associated with transformation. And I think, and Venezuela is no exception in those studies that we have been doing uh, 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 recently, no? Um, and that, for that reason, going forward, people uh, uh, see oil, uh, there is huge expectation that oil will be kind of the, if you wish, the new, again, the savior of the Venezuelan economy. No, uh, You have a country that has defaulted on a debt that because the GDP has shrunk so much that now that they represent 300% of GDP. No, Therefore, uh, it, honestly, if you look at based on today's GDP, it's impossible to pay that debt, no? But of course, if uh, what the way people see it right now is that, well, I mean, if you recover the sector, the economy will grow, and then you recover the capacity to pay, and Venezuela can pay debt, and access to new financial resources to develop and all things. So, so there are huge expectations uh, on the oil sector for the recovery of Venezuela, no? Uh, however, I think there are major issues going forward, no? That, that uh, 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 and that is important to, to take into account, no? So the world, uh, and this is not a surprise, the world is very different to the world of 2008 or even to the world of 2000, I don't know, 15 or, uh, no? Uh, 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 so the, the carbonization is a reality. The Paris Agreement is a reality. Uh, um, uh, and therefore, uh, and in that context, even though Venezuela has a very cheap oil, if you wish, it also have a oil that have a very large carbon footprint. Uh, and, and therefore, there, there is a big question, no, about uh, how much of that oil can you get out in a context of the Paris Agreement, no, uh, uh, in a context where, you know, firms are trying to reduce carbon footprint, even oil firms are trying to reduce their own carbon footprint, no? Uh, and you see these efforts by Ecopetrol, Petrobras, or US firms of, of reducing their carbon footprint. So there is a big question on, you know, what uh, what is really the potential of developing this oil in this context of decarbonization. And of course, I mean, there is all this issue uh, about, you know, uh, 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 in a way, the rep reputational hit right now that the oil sector has in Venezuela in terms of issues related to corruption, and therefore, many actors will be very cautious to get into it just to protect themselves about is uh, issues related to anti-money laundering uh, regulations and things like that. As well as, uh, you know, uh, there has been achievement has been returned because of poor quality or, or, or things like that. So, so clearly, I mean, so, so there is this, this question about, you know, uh, what is the real potential of oil in Venezuela in this new world context, no? And, uh, the second issue is that oil does not have the same power to lift the boats. No, in a way, think a little. I mean, the, the analogy that I like to use is that we, we think about this 
you know, see that you have oil as a wave that lifts boats, no? Uh, and that's kind of the the the, the metaphor in, in many people's mind, no? Uh, but uh, what we, I mean, there has not been many, uh, uh, as you know, statistics are very difficult to combine recently in Venezuela, but even in the most official uh, um, uh, social accounting metrics that you can have in Venezuela, that this was around 2015, and the multipliers of the oil sector are not the same that you had in 97, no? Uh, and it's because it almost became more like a fiscal multiplier than an activity multiplier. And by that, I mean, is that because PDVSA became an agent of executing public expenditure, that, uh, right, social programs, things like that, that the, when you look at the multiplier, it looks more closely to the multiplier of the government expenditure than the traditional multiplier that will, was done because it demands services from firms and then those those firms demand more services and you have like this power of lifting if you wish the boat, no? So clearly that power that we had uh, before is not necessarily the same today in this economic context, no? Uh, and then uh, uh, an important issue that again, the world is different today than it was, I don't know, eight, five, 10 years ago is whether or not uh, you have like a social license, no? So uh, do, do people really uh, support uh, the oil sector, no? And, and there we, we have done, uh, as my friends from Castle know, we have done a lot of research uh, in that area. Uh, so the good news is that two thirds or almost like three fourths of the population believe that oil is good for the economy. That's what we call a, an implicit social license. So people do believe that the oil sector is good for the economy. Therefore, you do have the social license, no? However, what are the challenges that we see there? One is this issue about distributive justice. There is this perception that uh, the people are not getting their fair share of the oil business, no? Uh, and, and this is kind of whatever government comes next, he, the, he or she will have to think about how to deal with this issue, how to deal with the fact that people wants to have a bigger share of the pie, no? And and this is an historical issue in Venezuela, uh, and there are here two, two, two things, no? Of course, there is one right now that uh, 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 there has been a lot of centralization, uh, and we know that there's issues about transparency and all that, so of course, uh, uh, right now you don't know how much is the revenue and how much are you getting it. So, so that's kind of, the, the, let's say, the new conflict uh, in Venezuela. But historically, there are also this big conflict about how oil producing region uh, felt about being left out of sharing the wealth of the oil sector, no? Uh, and, and, and well, I mean, I, uh, I was born in, in Caracas, but I spent eight years of my life in uh, El Zulia, no? So, so we all know this feeling of uh, maracuchos, of Zulianos that feel that, you know, they are not getting their share of the oil sector, no? And, and, uh, and, and, has, and there are a lot of uh, popular expressions in literature, songs, and things like that. Uh, but it was actually a political movement. I mean, we, we kind of sometimes forget our history, but uh, that eventually led to the approval of the Ley de Asignaciones Especiales, la LAE, which precisely was like a historical uh, a wing for the oil producing regions to have a share of the pie. No? Therefore, uh, when we think about going forward, uh, the, uh, any new government, we have to take into account how do we uh, give people that claim that they feel that they are not getting their fair share in the revenue of the oil sector, no? A second issue that, that we see is a, a procedural justice, no? Uh, and in general, in the region and in Latin America, there is this perception that firms do not sit with the communities, uh, they don't listen to them, and they don't pay attention to the environment. No, so I, I think that, uh, and you know, uh, uh, the the way, I mean, uh, th this is not new. I'm going to say, I mean, b because th this is a feeling that we we seen in a long time, but clearly, I mean, it has gotten worse uh, with the current administration. No, uh, uh, but but clear, but here comes a new challenge. Also, is that uh, uh, people 
we like to have better relation. They want the, the whoever is operating the oil sector in my neighborhood that to sit with me, talk to me, and take care of my concerns. No, so so that's kind of something new. No, uh, and finally the the third one is that if you look a map of Venezuela and and I, I'm working with our colleagues of ANOVA, which is a firm that does economic analysis, uh, they have produced a map of vulnerable municipalities in Venezuela. And what is really astonishing is that today, many of those vulnerable municipalities are all in the oil sector. But it, it kind of makes sense because of the collapse of the sector, these are communities that have lost employment. That have, so, so now you have also the challenge that many of the producing areas, uh, remember we, we're talking about social license, has been really negatively affected by this crisis. No? So, that, so therefore, whatever you do, you have also to think how you have a strategy to deal with this community that has been really hit hard, especially with the collapse over the last year. So, 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 so then again, in summary, I mean, there are huge expectations about the oil sector, but I think that we have to be very careful on how we take this expectation. Uh, because as, as I mentioned, we are now in a context of decarbonization uh, and that is going to affect our potential. Second, because we don't have the same oil sector be, the, or, or the same, not, and I want to, uh, be clear here it's not only the oil sector but you know the, uh, the what, what we call the ecosystem around the oil sector that we had in 1997 that because oil invested then a lot of firms uh, then also invested generate employment we don't have that ecosystem that we had before and there we have to be also very mindful of the social license that has been kind of put aside uh, in this content but if we think about a democratic transition we need to get the social license to operate you know? Okay, Asma, thank you very much. So last but not least, we pass the, to Benedict. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, sorry about this light. I'm in the very north of Norway in a cabin and uh, I'm on, I don't have Wi-Fi. So um, I hope that the line is, remains stable. You also see it's very light here with the you have a midnight sun and extremely bright. Um, I would like to start uh, with a sort of uh, based on on the analysis by by all the rest uh, that shows us in a way that the glass is half full. It's uh, uh, there are lots of limitations uh, on this uh, these elections. We see as as Anais mentioned uh, arrests uh, and harassment of the opposition candidates, uh, of course, and, and lots of limitations to their ability to reach the national media, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we also see Maria Corina Machado uh, is going to uh, is kind of amasses enormous uh, groups uh, of people and and Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia is still on, on the ballot. So it's kind of, I think everybody, both within uh, Venezuela and outside, we're kind of holding our breath. We're waiting for the next move, but still there is, uh, there will be elections and there are some openings for a change. And so the question that I would like to explore is what is the role of the international community in all of this? What has the international community done so far? And uh, what's the possibility of, of them playing uh, a role uh, in in the weeks to come and the months to come, and also uh, what does the as possible success um, uh, depend on internationally? Um, so before I start, just to mention that when I talk about the international community, I am talking about essentially uh, Europe, the U.S., and most of Latin America. Uh, those countries that are doing something uh, to pursue. Uh, democracy abroad. And there's many countries in Latin America that's doing that. The EU, EU is trying to do it. And and also uh, the US, you know, there's, yeah, it's a big, big debate, but at least in this case. Um, and I think that and before I start, also really important to recognize that uh, whatever kind of democratic uh, improvements that there's been made in Venezuela, that is mostly due to uh, the, the role by the Venezuelans themselves, the the opposition that has come together in a way we haven't seen before, civil society that's played a huge role, 
uh, and uh, and also uh, Maria Corina Machado's campaigns and the uh, the internal elections in the opposition that allowed the opposition to reconnect with people across the country in a, in a way that we haven't seen in, in a long time. And of course, also the complete disgust uh, uh, by the regime of the majority of Venezuelans for many reasons that we've already discussed. So what what is the role that has been played by, oh, first, what, what's the interest of the uh, international community? That is, of course, a, a big question. And, um, and it, I think it has varied a lot. Uh, it's common to refer to the issue of migration. Of course, the U.S. is very interested in 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 uh, halting the enormous outflow of, of migrants. But I think we also see that in European countries, even in Norway, we get an increasing amount of of refugees and asylum seekers from Venezuela, and and there's government is a bit at loss of what to do with it. Then, of course, is the oil issue. We've discussed that already. Um, and it is also a, a factor that Venezuela has become a regime that harbors in organized crime and that contributes to the increased wave of crime in, in Latin America that we've seen re uh, recently. But I also think that we should not underestimate the, uh, the role of Venezuela as an example, an example that, of, that it, it, it might be possible to defeat an author autocratic regime and to roll back the democratic backsliding that you've seen in Venezuela to uh, uh, a point where we've gotten a fully fledged autocratic regime. And that is important because the world is looking for some positive examples. We've had some positive examples in Poland and, and some elsewhere, but Europe is struggling with uh, increased autocratic forces within their own countries and so is the US. And uh, I think it's quite evident that for uh, for the Biden administration to be able to show results of their engagement with Venezuela would be of great importance. So what have they done so far? So of course, before these elections, there were uh, two main processes of negotiations. One was the one that has been uh, facilitated by the government of Norway that has been conducted over two years in Mexico and finally resulted in the Barbados Agreement. That essentially provides a kind of a roadmap towards uh, free and fair elections where the government is is uh, obliged to provide the, the opposition with uh, with equal uh, and sort of facilitate a good democratic environment, allow all the candidates, there's a little lull writing that all the candidates within the frames of the laws, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, that was signed between the government and the opposition. And then the, uh, the uh, agreement that was signed between the US and, um, and the government in Doha uh, uh, that uh, was essentially about sanctions relief uh, in return for uh, for uh, elections, including allowing Maria Corina to run for for president. Both of these agreements are violated on a daily basis. So, uh, and some would argue that they're no lo they are no longer valid at all. I think that is. Um, incorrect on several accounts first uh, now we know that uh, there was also more recent um, discussions between the government and the uh, and the US uh, and also um the Barbados accord uh, accords have been uh, become a kind of point of reference it's not they're they're violated and there has not been uh, the parties have not put in place uh, a good monitoring me mechanism although there's been many attempts of doing that but still, there are a point of references, a reference. So when there's violations, you can say that these violations, uh, these are violations of this accord that you have signed uh, and not just some kind of random principle. Um, uh, uh, of course, also internationally, the, we should not um, underestimate the role of the ICC process, the International Criminal Court. Um, and, and the importance of international pressure for Maduro to reopen the office of the International Criminal Court uh, in March this year. That shows some kind of openness. I think it, what it's mainly a sign of is Maduro's 
uh, emphasis on some kind of international religi legitimacy. There were there have been points in the over the last years in Venezuela when you've thought that oh now the government doesn't even bother to pretend it is a democracy. But I think what you've seen over the last months is the importance of Maduro and his regime to uh, to kind of create a sort of um, a, to to aspire to for some democratic legitimacy, and that is itself a kind of an opening. And then also, I think it's important to recognize the role of the of the international community in supporting uh, um, dialogue within the opposition over many, many years. So the the unity that we see today is, of course, mostly the result of really um, um, impressive work internally in Venezuela, but it has also been supported by various different international actors over the last years. So what role is there for the international community now? Uh, we know that the uh, the um, the EU was uh, de-invited to as a, a electoral observer after uh, after uh, they only provided a very partial sanctions lifting, uh, a, a partial in la uh, lifting of the individual sanctions. Uh, earlier this year, but the Carter Center is confirmed as an observer, and so is a delegation from the from the um, uh, UN, uh, and uh, there's a few others. It's not what one would have wanted uh, in terms of international observation, but there are actors present, and as far as I understand, there's a huge uh, international press corps that will be present and will report from what is going on. Um, uh, these are, there's, it's, that is really important that there's some, uh, some methods of communications of possible further, um, further violations of the Barbados Accords could be electoral day uh, violence. It could be, uh, could be new, uh, banning of candidates. It could be basically anything, but what will also be incredibly important, I think, is to, uh, ensure that there's international uh, actors present in the case of uh, uh, of um, um, uh, opposition uh, win, because that will res have to result in some kind of negotiations. It's, it is a mystery for most of us to really get our hands heads around what will happen on that electoral day if there should be uh, an opposition win? Will will the director of the CN, the Electoral Council, Elvis Amoroso, it, it's hard to imagine him declaring uh, an opposition victory. But then it is so important that there are there is a strong uh, international cor uh, corps present. Um, the question of what can can this is there any possibility of this being successful has often been answered by making reference to other cases in in Latin American history and there isn't uh there's there are not many cases to to discuss of uh, autocratic leaders that are uh handing over power after democratic elections uh, but there's a few. There's the Pinochet uh, example from 1988 that's often referred to. There's also the Nicaragua example from 1990. And of course, but those were uh, had something in common, and that was that, that that they happened right after the end of the Cold War, and and the the short period in which there was no not many other alternatives in the world than a kind of U.S. dominated order. There's lots of things that are different um, in the, between these these cases, and I think that the Pinochet um, uh, the Pinochet uh, reference is, uh, is is interesting, uh, and then the, the an argument has been that he thought he was that he was going to win. There's no way Maduro can think he's going to win through democratic means, um, but. In that in that respect, I'm thinking that recently, over the last days, there has been a discussion over the polls, uh, a debate uh, between, among others, Francisco Rodriguez and various that argue that the Demo the the uh, the win, the sort of um, the lead of the opposition, is not as large as we think. 
Uh, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we should not try to overestimate these things because I think. But I think um, uh, it will. It it's better to 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 get a, a, an autocratic regime in there that thinks they're going to win than one that thinks they're going to lose because that will uh, will make it more important for to think up even more uh, harsh measures to repress uh, the opposition. But I think, of course, there's uh, there is uh, um, the broader issue here that is that we are in a very different world that also Osmo uh, mentioned than even we were uh, uh, in the last elections in 2018. Um, uh, there is a world where um, uh, with the Ukraine issue has changed completely uh, the priorities of uh, of Europe, uh, and uh, of course, we're right before the elections in the in the U.S. And Maduro can try to play the game, and uh, there's lots of indications that he he thinks that a new Trump administration will be easier to handle than the last one was, uh, uh, or just the last day with the assassination attempt on um, on Trump. Maduro went out to express his uh, his kind of. Uh, his support, uh, maybe as a as an attempt to reestablish some some uh, uh, some connections to to the Trump uh, administration, uh, and we all know that the last Trump administration wasn't uh, very favorable uh, uh, towards uh, Maduro. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the the, the, the <clears throat> another concern I have is exactly what is the international community going to do. Because uh, uh, in the 2018 election, there was the the kind of the main uh, the main punishment was to not recognize Maduro, and then there were a number of sanctions being imposed. Um, the, the the issue of sanctions has become, I think, um, very complicated uh, because it's also used so efficiently by the Maduro administration to delegitimize. Uh, uh, did legitimize opposition candidates because they have uh, openly supported sanctions and because uh, a lot of the uh, uh, Venezuelan population uh, have, have also felt the sanctions negatively on their uh, personally and there is a wide uh, majority of Venezuelans that are opposed to sanctions. So the question remains, what can actually the international community do if we see uh, a blunt fraud uh, in the upcoming elections. And I think that is something that's being discussed uh, quite uh, quite intensively uh, in the international community. And I think that um, uh, what one, one solution, one kind of answer to that question is to continue the engagement and not let go of these kind of openings for democratic dialogue. So uh, that wasn't a good answer to my own questions. I'm aware of that, but I think we can continue to discuss this uh, with the audience. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all for your comments. Um, and to leave it, it was great that you leave already some questions open that we can bring into the debate. I would like to just remind the, the audience to send that the Q&A is open. We have a part of questions already, but I have one point that I want to comment by what we have been discussed so far. So far. I see two main issues being discussed at the same time. The first one, will the election, we lost Benedict, so will the election bring more political crisis or not? So that is one question that is on the background, right? Some of you, I would say, Anais, see the glass much more empty than uh, Benedict saw the glass a little bit more full. But this idea that after the 29, what is going to happen? So this question is very open still. And it would be interesting if you guys have other remarks to do that. Um, because not only what is going to happen if the opposition wins, but also if Maduro uses, or the regime uses a very obvious manipulative tools to not allow the opposition to win. And uh, in a moment that the opposition has never been so uh, reconnected to the people as we are seeing the images with Marina Corina Machado. So that was this first question. Will What will happen after the elections? Will bring it more political crisis and instability or actually open a space for negotiation? 
I see, for example, and maybe you guys can delve a little bit more on that, that there is an interest from the opposition on negotiation, on on a certain level of engagement with the regime for a transition, while from the part of the regime, we do not seem to be having this opening, or at least it doesn't come out on the, the mass media or also an issue, right? Community media in Venezuela tends to be much more individual level and social media than official information. So that's the first issue. The second issue that is there is with the election, doesn't matter who comes to power or stay in power or the new regime that is in power, will it have enabled the, the possibility of finding new a new recovery path, new recovery trajectory of economic growth, or will be more of the same? And then it entered two questions that I have specific for Manuel and Osmel, but then uh, when it comes to this idea of the path of development based on oil, but the expectations of how the oil scenario is and uh, how to distribute um, how to distribute the, the revenues of this oil, but revenues that will not be as it was in the past. So these expectations on the background are very high, but the question is, will the person, will the whoever assumed the power come to power actually be doing more of the same or will we find space, political space, uh, to find new recovery path? And there is a whole thread behind all of this that Osmal and Benedict talk about, which is their, this decarbonization. We are talking about the real possibility of a lot of oil, Venezuelan oil staying in the ground because of its thickness, because of its pollution, because of the not being, PDVSA not being what it used to be in terms of invest, of attractivity investments and um, a different market, a different uh, demand when it comes to oil. Uh, and a different capability of Venezuela to produce as quick as possible. So, so there is this two levels of issues. While on the background is, even if there is the even if there is transition, even if there is a, a new government, and even if this government is capable of promising a new recovery, will this recovery actually be sabotaged by a, a global transformation that is on the background? So I think all your three, uh, your, the four comments leads me to those three main questions. So with that being said, maybe it would be interesting if some of you want to take the lead on this issue of will uh, what will happen on the 29 uh, after after like on the 29 or the 30. And if it would be interesting, I love this moment, this idea of it's an alternative context in which there is geopolitical competition to a US dominated order. And they are in Venezuela, right? If you go to Caracas, if you go, you see clearly that there are alternatives to it. So there is a new geopolitical context. Uh, and my question is, as you, you, you Benedict, talk much more about European, Latin America and US, but what about the other actors? What about the other influence international actors? Will they actually be capable of inf uh, influence in this post-election scenario? So based with all these comments, any of you want to take the lead of making a point on what is going to happen afterwards or nobody feels comfortable of actually saying something about it because it's so uncertain. Yes, I would like to start there. Definitely, it's a lot of un uncertainty, uh, although, as I say, I don't see the government uh, in the position of recognize uh, that their, their loss, the election. Uh, uh, I think they're preparing the, um, the ground uh, for all the opposite. And there's a lot of things that they can, they still can do, um, like uh, uh, ban the candidate of the cards of the candidate, not just one, but all the three. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, we, we, I think there's a possibility, as I say, uh, it's the first time that is, uh, uh, the, the opposition has reunited and the primary election has to uh, 
has come to to that make that possible because this there's a, a situation it says maria corina machado it's not in the unitary platform she's outside of the that coalition of of parties and there, there's some tensions uh, around the organization of the uh, electoral processes around her uh, um so I I think uh, wherever it happens, even even if the government it's um uh, it's willing to admit the results that they they of their lost, it's going to be a, a, a difficult road uh, because the election is is in July twenty eight, but the um, the possession of a new president is in January of 20, 2025. So there's a lot of months in between to make the conversation and the transition. And the main problem we see here is the, is the coordination uh, at, uh, within the groups and the parties in the opposition, because um, there's this uh, attitude in the Maria Corina and their group that they are uh, as they win the primary election, they, she is the leader and everybody has to subordinate it to her plan and her program. And th th that's a complicated situation in that part of the, of, of the problem. So um, I think, yes, it could be, um, even if the government recognized the results that they, they, of their loss, it's going to be a long road uh, in inside the opposition itself to 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 get the agreements that it's it going to be needed uh, to make a coalition government that we don't see in in this moment. So that. Um, well, well. Um, how much time do I have? No. Well. <laughs> It's a conversation. <laughs> well, very, very quick. Uh, I think that the um, uh, the government uh, have a very serious problem. I think that the government could be lose the election by 20 points, I think. Uh, would be 60 to 40. And probably a lot of guys of Chavism's process could be talk with the opposition and uh, make an agreement to build a transition. I I can I can imagine Amoroso talks <laughs> uh, uh, talking about the the loose. I think that the public sector, the worker or public sector are very disappointed with the government and a, a lot of people can be change their opinion uh, at the in, in at the last week and can vote for Edmundo. I, I think that the government can be prepared the transition in six months, Edmundo would be take the power at uh, 5 January of the next year. And I think that the country right now is totally stopped. Nobody <laughs> doing nothing. Uh, totally uh, stuck uh, thinking in the election. And I think the, there is a very great possibility to win. Never the opposition faces a Chavez government so weak or, or like weak like this. And I think that the the, the three years without uh, wages uh, increase is a very deep uh, ballot in the heart of the government. Um, I think that the fraud is impossible. The fraud with the uh, day robbery, the boats in the box, it's totally impossible. I talk with a uh, very uh, informate uh, CNE people 
and they say that the system is perfectly uh, safely and reliable. I think that the government could be pressured this um, this public sector, the poor people, the people that receive a club or some food to vote for him and could be guide the vote. But but I think that the the I I it's very difficult to me. Uh, imagine more than four or five million votes to Maduro, and it's very probably that if we vote uh, 12 million people, we can win seven to five million. It's probably. And the decarbonization in Venezuela is very tough because everybody think that Venezuela is a rich people, it's a rich country. Uh, because the oil and we have to increase dramatically the oil extraction. Every candidate uh, talk about the same. Um, <laughs> I don't hear or listen to any candidate uh, with a different approach about the extraction, about the oil or about the transition, the ecological transition. I think that the Chavism could be win uh, if disqualified at Mundo uh, three days before the election, four days before the election, and make a, a very dark fraud. But in this scenario, um, the government would be very weak, uh, would be a very big abstention and uh, the U.S. government uh, put put will put more sanctions. Chevron closed the door, and the economy goes to the hell. Thanks, guys. Um, well, given that we're following the order, um, I, I think you know, thinking a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, let me put it this way: I, I think that. If, or I would say that oil is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the recovery of Venezuela, uh -huh. uh, to talk jargon. But, but the point is that, you know, there is no sector that can be easily tapped and generate economic activity right now than the oil sector, no? Uh, but having said that, there are two things that I, I think is important. You will need something else. Um, uh, at, at the and what of my jobs uh, at the Inter-American Development Bank, we have done our, our analysis of value change in the agricultural sector, in the service sector. So, so are many there are many sectors that could offer potential uh, for Venezuela beyond the oil sector, no? And um, besides that, we don't we have to remember that also we have a huge mining potential that kind of have been taking a backseat always to oil historically, though before we, we at least have a production of bauxite, of iron ore, of you know, things like that, uh, that now are shut down, but we still have the potential to produce those minerals. Uh, um, I mean, I think right now, of course, there is an issue about negative connotation around the mining sector because it's too associated with bold and illegal mining in Venezuela, but we, we do have potential for more than that. Uh, uh, and I think that's another sector that, that that could be important for Venezuela, including we have some of these materials that are needed for the transition. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, there are many other sectors in the economy that uh, could bring growth to Venezuela and to diversify uh, the, the, the productive structure. But clearly, I mean, the first, uh, uh, as they say, well, we are. We all know here the. Uh, or, well, I mean, this is not a Venezuelan expression; it's a Latin American expression. It's even in the Juan Luis Guerra song. But you know, el mango bajito is oil. You need oil, no? <laughs> and that's clearly the, the sector that, that we need, no, to 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 grow. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, but but then I think that you have to realize this is a country that right now have a debt that is public debt only three hundred percent of GDP that clearly is in a very low, so, so thinking about 
how to finance investment, it's impossible to think that you will need foreign capital for all the sectors. Because right now, you don't have right now income savings to, to finance any productive investment. No? So clearly, any framework post election has to think about how do we win foreign nationals to oil, to mining, to we, because right now we don't have the savings in the country, we don't have the resources in the country. So, so clearly, any strategy has to be an strategy that that tracks foreign savings, no, uh, uh, and therefore that that's going to be a key issue. How do you create an environment that makes the country attractive to those foreign investors, no? So I leave it here for now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to add a few comments to that, I think um, I actually I, I don't see really that uh, I think your words, Louisa, was that the the sort of uh, an energy transition would uh, sabotage the the recovery. Um, first of all, I'm I'm worried about the energy transition in the whole world because the, the big drivers of that were the the EU, the Green Deal. Uh, it was uh, also the Biden administration and it's been China. Uh, and and at least two of those are, are in in a big risk of changing. Uh, the, the sort of Euro European Green Deal is still on, but there's there there might be changes, and God knows what could happen in the U.S. Uh, with the Trump administration. So, so I'm not uh, I'm not that concerned that there's going to be a full stop of the oil industry. And I think most of those study that I come from an extractive oil country myself, and we've had the discussions for a long time. Of when to uh, to if we should uh, put a stop date on on oil exploration, uh, and the Russia invasion in Ukraine just turned that debate upside down. Now we're sort of gradually uh, re um, <laughs> starting to discuss it again, but it's all in a security context, and and so. Uh, so I think that that is not a big issue. Big issue, and I do think that. Um, I think it's Edgardo Lander once said that uh, the, the sort of the the conflict between Chavismo and the opposition ate all other discussion, all other big social debates in in Venezuela, including the environmental one that's been put on the back burner. And I do think that that um, a, a democratic transition with sort of solid public debates about what is going to happen in the country can only be positive. But then you can both have uh, a discussion about an energy transition and a discussion about the recovery of the oil sector. So I'm not really concerned about that. It's going to be sort of sabotaging the the recovery. I think I think what can really help the recovery is the uh, is the return to a democratic politics with good public debates and and decision making. When it comes to the other actors, I think that is really important. It's not only the US and the EU, you also have China, you also have Russia, you have other forces and you see in the in 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 sort of the Venezuelan scene today, there's also a lot of other investors from the Middle East and Manuel and I did a kind of a, a little safari <laughs> in, in 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 central Caracas area so sort of looking at the the storefronts and and what are the new investors here? It's, of course, there's many others. But I think um, about China, it's, I mean, China has played a very, yeah, a very sort of um, not, a, not a very prominent role. Uh, it's more something that the, the, the government tries to kind of show that we have the backing of, an, of China. And sometimes they said we're going to have the Chinese model. That's, that's a way of, of enticing business communities to have some kind of faith in the country in spite of lack of democracy. But uh, but it's also very, very clear that the Chinese are tired of the corruption and the lack of repayment of debt and all of that. So they're not gonna back, back the country in a strong way. They're also not going to cut the ties. They're gonna uh, present it as if it were a, a, an important partner for all sorts of political reasons, but other than that, not not providing any kind of strong support. Uh, and also, I mean, Russia has been the has been the the savior during, uh, in especially in the first years of the sanctions. But Russia has, to put it very uh, mildly, some other issues on its own plate at the moment. So 
also that is not they're not playing a very active role as i as i can can observe but of course they're interested in keeping the connection to venezuela as the kind of important nod in their latin american network and always as an important uh, a important partner in order to get back at the U.S. when that is kind of in their interests uh, to, uh, and we've seen that also some some kind of uh, political noise lately. But it also doesn't really mean a very strong presence economically or politically. It's more kind of this sort of uh, geopolitical uh, association for for many other reasons. It's. Venezuela is the proxy, if anything, because their their really interest is not Venezuela. It's it is uh, it is uh, a whole different game where Venezuela can play a small role. So, so I think that um, yeah, I, I think the real important actor is again uh, in in this sort of end game of the nego uh, the negotiations is again the U.S., but also and uh, the neighboring countries, Brazil and and uh, Colombia. And especially Brazil can play an important role in in a, a, particularly in a transition. Now they've tried to sort of encourage this agreement about sort of respecting rights in a post transition period. It doesn't really hasn't really come to much concrete, but that is a potentially very important role, I think. Great, thank you. Uh, because we ended on the international, I'm going to skip one of my questions and jump to one of the questions that we have on the on the on the chat here. Because they are asking basically how and and as Benedict already spoken, maybe somebody else wants to contribute. How do you interpret the U.S. recent re-engagement with the regime? Right? How the U.S. expectations with the election have changed since October, and how do you think it will impact the reaction afterwards? been surprised that the State Department hasn't issued statements condemning the recent events like the kidnapping of Marina Corina security detail. Some, and then the upper question also asks exactly second turn of Trump uh, that is plausible and what are the expectations on that? So I would add on this maybe the role, if any of you want to uh, advance a little bit more on the, the important role of Chevron has played recently because of the anti bloqueo law and uh, some sanctions that were open, some that was closed again, and how this, this opening and close of sanctions has been played out by the United States to try to influence the elections uh, on the last two years. So if anybody wants to pick up on this question, it would be great. Um, Anais, you want to start? Yeah. No, just a, a short comment. I think uh, the Biden's administration has understood that there's no, there's it was it wasn't going to be a regime change for by violence or for um, intervention or an army intervention. So they are they are trying uh, in some in some way to to smooth the relationships uh, with the Maduro government, and I think they they are preparing themselves for the re-elections of, of the Maduro government. I think these agreements uh, points uh, to that, and not so much to a transition. But that's just. Uh, my impression um i think that uh real i i if i'm not wrong i you benedict can can correct me the the last licenses that uh, has been given by the ofac is for two years but but not by six months they are they are being extend some 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 licenses for i think for the gas um but i'm not sure uh, i think the u.s is um is what is preventing that the uh, Trump re-election could be um, uh, in, in could, could put in some danger the is the um, the supply of the petroleum the production that is more debt that Chevron is is taking from this the extraction, and I think the negotiations point to that uh, to prevent uh, not only the re-election of Maduro but the re a second uh, amendment for for Trump for President Trump um, just that.
Well, well, uh, I think that uh, Chevron is the most important uh, economic agent agent in Venezuela. Chevron sustained the uh, appreciation of Thai currency. Uh, Chevron sustained the um, against inflation policy of the government. Chevron um, feed the the dollars market and uh, could be help uh, in the control of the prices and the uh, imagine of the stabilization that the government sells Chevron is almost the second central bank in Venezuela <laughs> right now and uh, if Chevron goes out or run out of the country we will um, gain very deeply problems right now. Well, Biden could win with the democratic uh, transition in Venezuela. Biden could be um, sell the democratic transition like a triumph for their uh, him administration. And I think that the um, Biden can help to try to avoid the Edmundo disqualifying and try to dialogue from uh, with the government to eliminate or erase the rewards in the Maduro heads and the and, and other guys. Maduro have a reward of fifteen million dollars. This is a very deeply uh, concerned in the government and um, I, I think 10 or 15 uh, um, leadership of the Chavism have reward in their hair, heads and I think that Biden could be erased these rewards and could be negotiation or, or be or realize a negotiation to make a transition a transition, a quiet transition. I think, and this is the last, um, never in the history, in the Venezuelan history, USA have a brutal and solid control of the oil, of the Venezuelan oil. USA can set, you can sell oil to this, you can buy gas to that, and uh, the control over the uh, oil economy of Venezuela is total. It's absolutely total. But that not uh, is um, a very good strategy to recover the oil industry in Venezuela. With Maduro, it's impossible to recover the gas industry, the oil industry, and the energy industry. We have a very serious problem with the energy, with the power, with the electricity, and uh, we have uh, investment like uh, $15 billion. And with Maduro, it's impossible to reach this amount, this money. And I think that the Chavism Elite knows that, and the bourgeoisie of the government, the Bolivian bourgeoisie, knows that and understand that Maduro it's a very large uh, block to develop his or their business and their their increase their gains with their capital investment. Thanks. Uh, just a question, and maybe Osmo can jump in on that because maybe the the audience will be questioning this because Manuel, you're saying Chevron is, as you mentioned, the central bank, and US has a lot of control. The second central bank, <laughs> but it is an image that doesn't come across that much for the for the audience that look at Venezuela from outside. There is an idea that since the sanctions began, all the companies left, and there is no more US influence. So maybe it would be interesting for some of you, like or Osmel, you already connected. Um, 
what do you mean by that? Maybe, Manal, because I think you are talking about the anti blockade law, right? These, the, 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 which went against even the, the constitution when it comes to uh, enable uh, on the share uh, the shares of uh, private international companies in relation to the the state uh, capacity capacity. So that's what you mean by the, the United States having control is since the anti blockade law. Uh, well, um, I think that the the control of the oil industry of Venezuela is ruling by the OFAC. Uh, principally the, the state of the, uh, the Department of State of USA. If you want to buy uh, Venezuelan oil or make an investment, you have to talk with the USA government and said, hi, I want to invest, I want to buy, I want to sell some oil or gas or uh, some additive to gasoil, to fuel uh, with Venezuela. And uh, um, never in the history of the country, uh, USA uh, was got a power like this to decide the commercial rules of the oil company. This is the one point. The second point, it's the, the Chevron is the second central bank because Chevron feed the um, money tables, Chevron sells a big quantity of dollars in the Venezuelan internal market of, um, of dollars. And the, the dollars that sell Chevron, let's, um, let's have a really a stabilization of the type of currency between uh, 36 bolivares per dollar. And this is the key of the program Venezuela is fixed. That the government tried to sell that Venezuela is a normal country and Venezuela it's a very a happy nation. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think Osmao want to jump in. No, I, I wanted <laughs> to, to clarify two things. I think it's important to realize that you know, there have been a huge, even from 2019, you know, a huge important change. You no, know, since uh, uh, October 2019 was more like an on and off things, but consistently after October 2021, the US now is an ex exporter of oil. So this is a different world, no? Before we have this mind of this country that needed a lot of oil. Remember that famous Bush speech that we are addicted to oil? Uh, well, not anymore, no? So so, so this is a country now that exports oil, no? Uh, uh, so therefore, the, their view is different than probably was even in 2019. So I think that this is something that, that we need to take into account how they do their calculations today, no? Uh, 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 so, so that's uh, issue number one, no? Uh, and uh, uh, and issue number two, uh, I think this is important about the license because, you know, the issue with the license, I mean, this is, remember, oil is a long-term business, no? This is a business that you need long-term, so right, so you plan ahead, you need to do, and, and licenses are temporary things. So that's why what happened is that we have, when, when they uh, gave the general license, no one invested because people need certainty for the long term, no certainty for two, six months, two years, and things like that. No, so so that's the, the big issue right now is that you need certainty for the long term. So so that's not necessarily license will give those incentives to people, and that's where then Chevron plays a big role because basically since Chevron never left, uh, you 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 mentioned not this image that everybody left, but Chevron never left, no, uh, uh, is the one that has the operation ready to start again, no, so they without big investment can almost like switch on and off, no, and therefore have oil, produce oil and all that, no, so so that that's a little bit, you know, the, the context, no, that, that right now you only have if you wish have one big operator that can switch on and off, produce oil. And of course, because it's the only producing oil, then it becomes the main source of dollars, as uh, Emmanuel was saying in the economy, you know? Uh, so that, that's kind of the context, you know, that, that, that right now you, you, the, the big challenge is to have long-term commitments that allows other actors to come here and put money in Venezuela. 
Yeah, I don't have too much to add, but I just wanted to say that I think I think not only the oil companies, but the business community is an important uh, important. It's not one actor; it's many actors. But I I've interviewed people in the international business community that said, well, you know, for us. Uh, a stable Maduro government might be better than an opposition that throws us out in the unknown. And I think that is a kind of a narrative that is uh, is very much encouraged by the Maduro government. And among some groups, it has gotten some traction. Uh, and I think it's really important then to focus on those issues that you've discussed on the sort of the, the long term and the, and that doesn't go so much for the oil company because the companies because the oil companies lead, need to invest they need long term certainty uh, other companies can be more off and on uh, but of course it's the, the oil business that will that will lead to the real uh, <laughs> that would would help the co country to recover in kind of short and medium term but uh, we've seen other other kind of businesses also so alleviating a little bit of the symptoms of the crisis, not really changing the whole uh, the crisis, and uh, the the uh, so, um, and I think I think it's also an important actor to to look at um, on on the U.S. policy. Yeah, why it hasn't uh, pronounced itself on the on uh, the kidnapping of Maria Corina's security uh, chief there's also other many other issues i think that the international actors are playing very very kind of um from day to day trying to evaluate what to uh, denounce and what not to denounce because they're also i i can speak mostly maybe for my own government i know that there have been kind of evaluating each case because they know that they can be thrown out any day. It's not so clear with the U.S., of course, but it's important to keep that dialogue and uh, and uh, to, to run a fine balance between criticizing for obvious human rights violations, but also not to break off uh, the communication lines. And I think it's going to be almost no matter what happens, that is going to be some very important and very difficult trade-offs to be made, kind of to what extent then to sort of to uh, keep the principles in the Barbados Accord, the human rights principles, and to what extent should one kind of negotiate things in order to, to foster some kind of transition. So, um, yeah. But there might also come a denouncement. It's it's still very recent that incidents. And you saw when uh, uh, when Rocio San Miguel was in prison, there was a major uh, reaction uh, from the international community, and also with several others of those um, important events. But then there's little events every day almost of of people losing their business because they have hosted the opposition or or some other things that are not being denounced that clearly. Yeah, this goes exactly what I said in the beginning, right? Like the life the last couple of months has been exactly waking up and dreading the news. Um, so with that being said, there is one more question here that is actually connecting to what Benedict already mentioned a little bit which is given Maduro's weakness and unpopularity, do you think that the interests of Chavismo economic elite could ever dominate the interests of the political elite? So I think the question here is, again, returning to actors and making these contracts between political elite and economic elite. Manuel has been mentioning the, the, the Boliburguesia, this, this more, the militarist Madurist movement uh, uh, coalition, um, how then you would maybe answer this question? Because for me, sometimes I see that the political and the business elite can can mix and match in Venezuela. And that has been the trajectory of Venezuela. This is not necessarily a particularity of the Chavista period, right? Other moments, there was also those interconnections. And I think this is exactly because of a, a rentier, a rentier uh, economical system in which the distribution of rents is based exactly on how close to are of those redistributing. But there is 
as as Benedict mentioned, there is some incipient, more independent, small business uh, elite in, and not necessarily elite, but, but a group, right? A, a business group in Venezuela. And it seems to have been accepted the accommodation of Madurismo, right? So would you like to make some, some to answer this question that has been posed um, more in details, any of you? We also don't need to go in order. If you want to jump in and answer, it would be okay. Uh, yeah, I would like to point uh, some uh, one more thing about the relation with the U.S. and is the immigration uh, and the problem the Venezuelan immigration to the U.S. and how this has been in the center uh, in both campaigns in, in the USA, the U.S. campaign and the Venezuelan campaign. Um, I don't think I really really don't think that um, if um, Maduro re-elect, uh, there's going to be a peak. I think the immigration in Venezuela is going to be now a structural problem as is for the uh, for Colombia and for Ecuador and for, for Peru and for the Mexicans, I think, um, because the conditions in the in the country, in the borders and around are, are more and more difficult for, for Venezuelans. Um, I think people, it, it's not going to stop uh, trying to leave because uh, the condition is not going to improve in the in the long term, uh, even if the, the, there's a, trans, a transition and, and a new government, the condition is going to be hard and difficult for a, a, a period still. So um, I, I don't see the difference between the economica and between the Chavista economica elite and elite and the political. I think there's um, I think there are some uh, of the economic uh, of the economica economical elite that has um, made agreements with the Chavism because the principal uh, uh, chamber, for example, Fede Cámaras and Con Industria have negotiated with the government some things and have uh, even some of their leader uh, of their leaders has said there is no difference of who's going to win the election because the the, um, the entrepreneurs have already a conversation with the government and they have made some agreements about some specific things. So I, I don't know, it's, it's not clear for me what is the difference here, but um, I don't have many information either to say what is the difference in between in the Chavista elite, uh, political elite, and the Chavista economic elite. I think, has, as you say, in some there there are mix up. There are a lot, a lot mix up, and there are another uh, outside of that, the traditional entrepreneurs in Venezuela that has made. Um, See, yes, some kind of agreement with the government, and I don't think they are especially worried uh, by the result uh, of this election, or even if they want a change as the majority of the Venezuelans wants and understands that we need another, um, uh, another situation and another kind of government to, to, to make plans and to make, uh, yeah, to make plans, basically, to... Um, well, well, I, I, I think that uh, in Venezuela we have two big groups into the Chavism process. I think that a solid group is the military group, the army group, uh, with some guys of the bureaucratic establishment. And the second group is the same group, but with less money. That's only less money, less uh, business. And with a serious problem with the human rights violations. I think that the principal group with a, a big amount, a uh, big quantity of money, uh, think uh, that it's better to give the power in, by the good terms uh, in peace. Because uh, for me, the only way to win the government 
it's by a fraud, a big fraud, a big violent fraud. And with big violent fraud, we have to, to see in the street protests, violence, and um, problems. With the big fraud, Colombia, the government of Colombia, Brazil, Mex Mexico, and Chile, it will be the boards of the Venezuelan government. And I think that the they going to say, hey, this is not a democracy. This is a fraud. The government uh, kills people in the, in the street. And uh, Russia, China, and China uh, probably divorce to the Maduro's government if Maduro's government make a big fraud. And um, in this scenario, uh, the um, the most richest of, of the ruling class of the Chavez process would be lost, will be lost with more sanction and with a zombie economy. One economy without in big investment, without dynam dynamics, and with a big quantity of problems that they can resolve, especially the energy, the productivity, productivity and a, a big exodus to re, reborn. And they are, they, they will be a very serious problem to Colombia, to Brazil, to USA. And for me, it's the very more complicated way and if the government decide this way, is it's because the radical win imposed the this direction, and and I think that the radical win is very weak uh, right now. I I just wanted to add two things because I, I well I mean, um. Uh, my colleagues here at the panel are more political <laughs> scientists than myself, so I, I will not enter too much into the political science, but the, I would like to add two things. One is on migration that I, I think I, I agree with Anaí. I think that there is a misunderstanding that, you know, that if there is political change tomorrow, people will stop leaving the country. It's not like that. We have done studies. I, I have before this same hat, but for Mexico and Central America, and we did a study with, a, you know, for those of you that are economists with a gravity model and things like that. And as long as there is a huge difference on income, people will continue to leave the country. So, so I think that at the end, you have to believe, I mean, you have to understand that people will continue living in Venezuela as long as there is no growth and no job opportunities, no? Uh, and, and therefore, uh, even we, we did in a scenario once that even, you know, with the country growing down 10% because everybody believes in the country and investment, you will still be sending migrants for five, six years, no? Even if you grow at high rates. So I think this is something that people need to understand that, you know, as long as there is this gap, people will continue to leave the country. No? Uh, and then going to the uh, economic elite, I think that's something that, honestly, I haven't seen any study of it and we need to understand better is if you disentangle all these uh, distortions that we'll have you have today in the economy who wins and who loses no and i think that's a very because on one side you see export today i mean people don't realize but we are exporting coffee we are exporting some uh, shrimps we're exporting tuna i actually bought a venezuelan tuna here in the supermarket in the us no uh, uh, so, so I mean, so you have things, and so your prior is, I mean, this, if these people can survive this environment, they can survive anything, but we don't know, because when you begin to take all the distortions, and uh, maybe, yes, they will have electricity, but it will be more expensive. So, so, I mean, I think that we need to understand who wins and who loses if you do a transition, because that way you will understand the incentive of the, of the economic uh, uh, groups, no? That I think no one has really... Uh, uh, has done very carefully, no? And I think this is something that we need to understand better. If you disentangle of this distortion, who is going to win and who is going to lose? Because I think we don't have today a clear picture about that, no? Yeah, I think that is a really interesting point, uh, sort of who's going to win and who's going to lose in that transition and that the country is very different than it was some some years ago. A lot of new actors that have learned to, to uh, 
just to really difficult con conditions. But I think most of the business community still wants a change. And uh, one of the major reasons that Manuel has written a lot about is the lack of credit, sort of the, the total absolute lack of credit in the country and the fact that the sanctions still prevent uh, also private businesses from getting credits from abroad because they lifted oil sanctions but they haven't lifted sort of in the financial markets there's still strong limitations against providing uh providing credits also to venezuelan private actors although there shouldn't actually be but there there still is so i think that um yeah I think most of the 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 the, the uh, environmental community, no, the the business community is very much uh, for a change. But I also think I totally agree with with Anais that there is it's hard a very strong distinction between the political and the economic elite, uh, uh, Chav yeah, Chavista elite. I think the big distinction is between the Chavista elite and the Chavista basis, and there is a lot of uh, that is something I. I don't know much about, but the, the relationship there is probably one of the things that is going to to decide the elections. To what extent have the sort of the the uh, grassroots of the Chavi of the PSOV and sort of the yeah the Chavista grassroots just fallen apart? Um, and I think what what we've discussed a little bit is sort of how is rather the whole the relationship between sort of the, the what the ties the the government and the business community together what kind of relationships that is what is changing, uh, but there's not a sort of distinction between the the elites. It's it's different different incentives, different policies. It's not the kind of chavismo that we saw. Before the pandemic and before the the crisis, it's there's uh, it's different, but the ties between the political elites and the economic elites are incredibly close. Um, uh, and and but but there is a a change in the in in the fact that the traditional business community is no longer a strong. Uh, political opposition bastion it has accommodated itself to uh, to the politics to survive basically can i just have to hand no i i agree that the, everybody wants a change not that one though but i i think i think more about the governance after after one no? because we have seen for example a lot of private sector concerns saying no if you disentangle everything they're going to wipe out, especially there is a huge concern about the private, the Colombian private sector, you know, that is really competitive. And that if you dismantle all kind of distortion, then, you know, they can disappear in a way, you know, the, the dependence. So that's my concern. No, it's talking a little bit who wins, who loses, and the governance after that. See, people do want to change. But then the, the question is how is going the negotiations, no, and the governance after that with that private sector, no? Um, yeah, thank you for the comments. I would, one thing while listening and, and looking into the questions we organize and what we have discussed so far, um, for me, it's, it's a topic that we have been discussing a lot on the project on the last three years of the project is the how extractivism is prone to social, political, economical crisis, but it's also those cyclical crises that actually work as a source of persistence of extractivism. And I think this discussion is leading us to something similar to that. We are now in a, in a, in a maybe a moment of a, a political rupture that will open some windows of negotiation, some, some windows of change or accommodation with whoever wins and how is going to be the, the process afterwards. And this level, the, the level of crisis that drove to this context makes, as Benedict put it, all the other problems on the be on behind, which means that whoever rises to power will have to, it will maintain the, the need, will maintain the extractivism model, and will continue uh, create those expectations on the richness of oil. And I wanted to discuss today, but we didn't have time on the issue of the the whole Arco, uh, Arco Minero de Orinoco being maybe an expansion, not sowing only oil, but sowing mining as an alternative. Like we're not rich only on oil, but also in other minings. And is this richness that brings us to development? We just need to change who is this, who is dominating the institutions and to whom the, the rents are being distributed. 
And if we do it right, we're gonna find change. So the cycle continues through the through the, those crises. And I think Venezuela is a, a very important case to look into discontinuities because there was other moments of crisis and, and exhaustion of the system, the exhaustion of the, the Punto Fijo moment also led to a completely different group that rose to power with highly popularity. And the promise was just a different way of distribution, uh, distributing the rents of extractivism. And so the cycle maintains, maintains itself. And But the main question right now is exactly what is gonna happen with the election. With that being said, we are reaching our, the limit of our times, I would say, uh, first of all, thank you. And I would last ask if any of you want to make a final remark, like quickly final remark about your points or expectations of what's gonna happen in the next 11 days. Is anybody want to make some point, uh, Anais, please? Just a quick, quick, it be very bad English. I would like to say that no matter what happens with the results, the country is still is going to be here and still we have the challenge uh, to think where are we going to do with all these problems that it's going more, it, it's much more that the conflict, as Benedict say, between Chavismo and opposition. We need to um, reach uh, programmatic agreements, and that's, that's I think, it, it doesn't exist right now, because, uh, and I um, agree here with Os Osmel, the governance, it's something that, um, it's difficult for us to see how it's going to be that governance, and um, it, it's kind of sad because uh, there are programs. Maria Corina Machado has a program that is very, very good program. We have very different, but for example, it's the, it's the few programs that we have seen in the last years that includes the, the energetic transition and it, it, it talks about the, the resources in another in another way. So, but there is no discussion about this. And I think that no matter what happens, what it matters, but Again, it is going to be at 29 and, and 30 and 31, and we have uh, the same problem. So I, I think that that's the major challenge for me right now, that the, the results is not going to be in a new uh, wave of depression and this demotivation for the, for the opposition, democratic opposition in Venezuela. So that's just that. Well, uh, so quick, um, I think that um, the government uh, have uh, to lose the power for me. <laughs> uh, this is the best way to think in the future for for them people. Uh, I think that the, if they lose in uh, 11 days, they can give the power to Edmundo. Edmundo will be a very weak uh, government with the National Assembly against, against with the uh, Venezuelan army against, with the prosecutor, with the Supreme Court against, and they they will be, have a very big problems to government, to make a decent government. And the Chavism could be gain a political support to the um, National Assembly election uh, for December to 2025. And I think that the government um, could be think in that in the good that would be Edmundo make the adjustment, the economic adjustment, uh, clean the, the debt, Restructure the debt, the external debt, um, could be um, uh, gain money from the IM, uh, INF or the of the World Bank. Uh, Edmundo would be fix the majority's economic problems, expense the credit. And uh, the government could be um, rebuild this popularity uh, since the opposition. Uh, Edmundo have to record to to cut uh, at least three million uh, people in the state. Three million, two million. It's a it's a crazy quantity. <laughs> 
to people uh, uh, to cut in the state to to make a very deep uh, adjustment economic adjustment very impopular adjustment they they have to increase the foil bill the the electricity the power bill uh, they they have to to make a a long uh, quantity of uh, bad impopular measurements and i think that the government could be let the economic crisis uh, to Edmundo, the big uh, the per se, um, the big jump of the type currency and they gain in the future political support sell or or telling well this is the government of the of the right of the extremely right they fight against the the people the poor people we are a bit best government we are a, a very harmful uh, governments governors and we love you <laughs> and Edmundo hate I hate you vote for me in 2025 and they can win in the National Assembly and rebuild the Chavism uh, since a very solid base with the economic fix uh, to Uh, I just want to say two things quickly. First, uh, I think that, you know, uh, you know, I, I think it was in the 70s or something like that, that, you know, the, the famous Yamani said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, no? And the Oil Age was going to end because no, it's not going to be because we ran out of oil, no? And at the time, it, it looks like a joke, but today we see with the carbonization where we are today, no? So so I think that going forward, my concern are two. One is that we are beginning to lose it. The train is leaving the station, no? Uh, on the oil. It's not, I mean, I agree with Benedict. It's not that we have a terminal T yet, but it's coming. <laughs> we don't know why, but it's coming. So so we, we the train is leaving the station. We, we are not getting there. And then we may also lose the mineral uh, <laughs> if we if we don't move quickly, no. So so I think that that's kind of one of uh, my my message that, that uh, I mean, well, I mean, uh, as they say, all the all the policy discussion in Venezuela is about the politics, and we have leaving all the other important policy issues outside, and, and we might miss some some important windows of opportunity that country. Uh, and the second one for me is the issue of managing expectation. And I think this for both sides. I think that both sides are creating expectations that maybe will not be able to meet the next day because of the challenges of the country. No, uh, And I think that, you know, managing expectation is going to become the name of the game uh, after uh, you write on a, no matter who wins <laughs> and how it wins. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the expectations may may not be uh, uh, what reality says. So, so I think that the key concern is how you manage expectations. No. I'm just simply going to say that I think there's going to be a, a need for the international community also on the 29th of July and for some weeks and months and maybe years after. So, uh, and I hope that we can continue this really important discussion. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining from Washington, from Norway, from Caracas. Uh, here from Germany, we're just very grateful that you accept the participation. And we wish you the best in the election for, for the Venezuelans in the room. And we will definitely catch up on a couple of days and talk about what is going on. Thank you so much and see you next time.